uh, uh, Carolina Hurricanes here. Uh, kind of been talking about them a little bit more recently as far as their upward trend. Um, and them starting all with back-to-back games outside the All-Star break, both of them being losses. Um, yesterday, we talked about their overtime loss to the Maple Leafs. And then last night, an identical score, 4-3 to three loss to the Ottawa Senators, kind of a, a, a blow to the belt in that game. Um, in the Metro with those two losses, things are tightening up more and more. They said 65 Rangers and Pittsburgh are both on their heels at 64 points apiece. The hurricanes had an opportunity to kind of run away with it in the Metro. Do you think that they're leaving the door wide open now for Pittsburgh, New York, even Washington to take, to, uh, come catch them? I don't. Um, last night, all betting odds, I would have bet against Carolina after going the distance and in overtime against Toronto, and you're playing your backup goaltender. Um, they just got beat last night. Simple as that. On a back-to-back night, those are always tough. Um, no. is Their defense and their – like. Their defense is tremendous. Like they've only given up 106 goals, which is insane. Um, the next closest is the Islanders with five games less played. They've given up 105. So it goes to show how good of a defensive team they are. And that's what it's going to come down to. All it takes is one goal and getting to shut down defensive mode, getting pucks deep. It's how you exhaust teams, and it's an easy way to win a game as long as you're not turning the puck over in your own end. Yeah. And yeah, even though, as you mentioned, um, in that game, I mean, back-to-back nights are always tough. Um, they go into the third period down 4-0. So that's where, even though, yeah, you you drop back-to-back games, it's to one of the worst teams in the league. In that third period, they score three goals, which is amazing. That's that that doesn't happen very often to where you score more than two goals in a single period in the NHL. So I'm obviously a little too late as far as them trying to make a surge and try to force that game to overtime. But um, yeah, the fact that they kind of came alive late in that game and showed, okay, yeah, we shit the bed the first two periods here. We got blanks, unable to find the back of the net. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not too concerned either. Although it's just like, I mean, I mean, anytime you you're a top team and you lose to one of the bottom teams, it's a, a little concerning. I mean, no matter what, regardless of back to back nights, back up goalie, things like that. Um, but as far as the grand scheme of things, they're still in the driver's seat again with less games played than New York and Pittsburgh, and they still have a lead. Um, and if I remember correctly, they play both Boston of them coming tomorrow. up tomorrow. But they play Boston, Wild, Panthers. Yeah, they do play the Penguins next Sunday. Um, yeah, and then some sprinkling some kind of lower teams there as well. So, um, yeah, obviously it'd be a good test playing, again, Wild, Panthers, Predators, Pens, as far as teams that are equally as good in other parts of the league or right behind them to kind of – for them to compare apples to apples of where they're at at this point of the season. Um, and if they can continue to sit on the, on the top of the Metro. Yeah. Then over sticking with the Metro, um, the New York Islanders currently are at 39 games. They have a long second half years. They have the most games to make up still. Do you see them as a threat in the Metro is making a wild card or the playoff spot. And do you think they have what it takes to repeat kind of what they did in the past two postseasons as far as Eastern conference finals? I, I kind of look at the Islanders situation, very similar to the Oilers, as far as hitting a rough stretch, being behind in games, the Oilers, uh, prove that 
they're right there. They're only six points out in the Pacific, um, still with games to make up. But for the Islanders, despite having the least amount of games played in the league, I think that being in the Metro is going to be too tall of a task um, as far as the physicalness of that division, making up those games to where they're going to have back-to-back nights, three games within a five-day period, probably at some point. Um, I mean, sitting at 38 points, they're, what is that? 16 from the Penguins, and they're eight games back. So if they win the eight-game differential that they do have, they're tied for basically second. Yeah, but that's if they win every single one of them. Right. Who knows who those eight games are that they have to make up? Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, and the, a, a concern for me is um, their goal scoring. Again, they do have games to make up, but look at everybody else in that Metro. 145, 158, 156, 153, the Islanders have 93 goals. They haven't even broke 100 yet this year. So, yes, as impressive as their goaltending has been, only 105 given up, um, their goal scoring just – isn't there to where, again, in that Metro, that physical gritty um, division in games to where you need a a go ahead goal, or you're trying to mount a comeback in the second, third period later in these games, that fatigue of these games sets in after a while. And as I had mentioned, making up games, you're going to have back-to-back nights, uh, packed weeks and playing in this division. I, I don't think that they, I mean, if they were in the Pacific, the Atlantic, more of that fast-paced, like skillful kind of kind of divisions, um, maybe they have a shot. But yeah, given where they're at in that division, I don't think that they, I don't think they get a wild card spot this year. They're just too far back. Yeah, I'm gonna disagree with you. Um, I think they do make the playoffs maybe even as a third seed and not just a wild card. Um, The type of hockey that they do play isn't the most fascinating to watch, but they do play defense. That is their main goal. They don't score a lot of goals. They're not a flashy team. They don't like – obviously, they'll take the goals if they're there, but they're not out there to beat Team 7-1 like some of these teams are, these higher-end skilled teams. And being the most rested team at this point by almost 10 games – that so much, so many, so many more miles they have less that they are now about to expose on these teams that are worn down, run down. They're they're the fresh team coming out of the gate here for the second half. Granted, it is going to be a little unruly, but the style of hockey that they play, they aren't flashy, they aren't fancy, they're in your face, tough nosed hockey. They are basically the hand. The staple of the Metropolitan Division as far as how you – the style of game you want to play. Um, Yeah, I mean, with these games that they got to make up, like I said, I think that they – out of the eight that they have to make up, I say they at least win six and leap the Capitals no problem uh, before the end of the year here. As Caps seem like they're struggling hard. Yeah, I'm kind of looking at the Islanders' schedule here coming up, at least for the rest of the month. They have some opportunities against some of the lower teams, Sabres, Canadians, Kraken. Um, These are all the games that they got to make up because the Canadian teams due to COVID. Yeah. Oilers, Canucks. Canucks is who they play tonight on Friday. Um, They play the Oilers. So, again, kind of a good comparison as far as two teams trying to make up their games as far as being rested, as you mentioned, having less miles on them. Um, so, yeah, the rest of the month, I mean, aside from finishing with uh, the Kings and Ducks, uh, Bruins in a couple games. So three of their last, like, eight games here of the month are against tougher opponents. So, yeah, they have an opportunity to – finish finish at least February on a good note but yeah when it comes to making up those games down the road in March and April as well um because yeah looking at March is going to be their most packed month they have 17 games in March 
So that's basically you're averaging a game every other day, the whole month. Some, some, including some back to backs. It's gonna have, yeah. I see one back to back. Like for instance, uh, on uh, in March here, they play Thursday, Friday, Sunday. So yeah, they play. That's what they do games. this week. They play today. They play Friday and Saturday. Yeah. So. Yeah, they have a lot of back to backs coming up. So even I mean, as you mentioned, having less miles on them makes them like the the fatigue factor isn't quite there yet. But they could burn out quickly in some of these where they play that third game in a four day period. That third game is going to be tough to where they're they're gassed and they they need a break to where they are catching making progress, but yet it's kind of a one step forward, two steps back as far as who they're matching up with, beating the right teams. Because if they keep losing to teams who are ahead of them, it's going to be hard to catch them. So, um, yeah, it'd be interesting. It's funny looking at the at the leaderboard, how they look so far back. Um, I mean, they have an opportunity to come back, but like I, I said to start here, I think that they're their goal scoring because eventually they're gonna they're gonna have a trip against the Atlantic. They're gonna have a a trip against the Central. Um, both both divisions, which the lack of goal scoring, I think, is gonna come back to bite them. Yeah, we'll see as it's coming up here. Yeah, and the games that they are making up soon here are the games they missed. Canucks, Flames, Oilers, Kraken, Sabres, Canadians, Red Wings, Capitals. Those are all coming up here pretty soon. So I feel like after these next three, F fuck, after these next five games, six, seven games, they're pretty much caught up. Yeah. Yeah. And then – some bonus news for you here today. Montreal Canadiens fire head coach Dominique Ducharme. They hire interim head coach Martin St. Louis, Hockey Hall of Famer, Stanley Cup champion, played for the Tampa Bay Lightning. Do you see he was the first small prototype to make it in the NHL? Given Montreal is a smaller team, do you see him having an impact on this Montreal Canadiens team? and turning this around at all? I mean, there has to be some kind of upside. <laughs> 23 points, which is last in the league right now. Um, oh, they're 8-30. and 30. Yeah, 8-30 and 7. Um, yeah, I mean, any, anytime there's a big change like this on a team that's bot bottom of the league, just that kind of extra motivation of a new face. What do they bring to the table? Um, that extra energy of I'm here to do this. This is this is how I'm going to do things different. Um, I mean, the Canadians, they have games to – yeah, well, they have some games to make up, but yet they're kind of pretty much on pace with the rest of the Atlantic. So obviously no shot of them coming back as far as making a playoff push this year. I mean. Yeah, their season was over, I think, about a month ago. Yeah. Unfortunately but, for them. But, yeah, I mean, again, with their goaltending, without Carey Price, they have the most goals given up, I think, in the entire league here. I'm looking. 179, yeah, that's the most in the league. Um, so being without him – has been their Achilles heel all year. Um, and even if he was there, their goal scoring, only 100 goals on the on the season, which puts them 20, 50, 90 goals behind <laughs> Florida. So even then, if they had Gary Price, I don't think it'd make a huge difference. But yeah, as far as a coaching change, obviously it was kind of a, a, a long time coming for them um, after – Again, just the craziness of them being in a Stanley Cup final last year and turning out looks like they're going to have that number one spot as the worst team this year. Never seen that before in any professional sports. 
but yeah, I mean, the only direction is up from here. You can't get any worse. <laughs> Yeah, um, I agree with that. And I, I do think Marty St. Louis will have an impact on this team as he kind of knows how to operate the game from a smaller point of view, being a smaller guy. So I feel like he'll be able to help out the Gallagher's, the Caulfield's, the Suzuki's, the little bit smaller guys that they do have on their team, maybe find success that they aren't finding it with the current structure of how that team is being ran. And then – um. What do you think about this move? Tuka Rask decides to retire today after coming back and signing a league minimum 750K contract like a few weeks ago to rejoin the Boston Bruins. Fucking couldn't stop a beach ball. Now he's done. What do you think about that move for a team like literally bringing back an old vet and just fucking can him? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's an interesting, it's definitely an interesting move at this point of the year. Um, I mean, Boston is still, they're kind of that middle point in the Atlantic. They're eight points back, but nine points ahead of, of Detroit. Um, but I mean, for Detroit, Detroit has seven more or three more games played. So as far as kind of trying to lock up a, a wild card there, uh, they're in the driver's seat for that. But I mean, when it comes to the playoffs, as far as making a run, it's who, who's hot in the net and, that that's usually who gives you a good indication of who's going to be there in your conference final and in the cup Um, and making a change like that for Boston, I think is going to be kind of detrimental to them (laughs) as far as the postseason, unless they can have um, who's there, who, who, who are they rolling with earlier? Was it all, um, was it all Mark, all Mark and Swayman. Swayman. Yep. Um, yeah, unless those two, one of those two guys can step in and get hot again. I mean, anytime, anytime you have kind of a goaltender carousel during a year, I think it's, it's, it's tough in the end. Um, I mean, like in the NFL, you have a quarterback carousel to where you're, you don't have a number one guy that you lean on for big games. And then the playoffs, if you're rotating or in this case, completely canning a guy, <laughs> Um, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be tough for them to make some noise in the playoffs if they make it. Cause again, right now they're just in the running for a wild card. And I mean, hell of a run for hell of a run for him as he's was a huge cornerstone in Boston winning, winning the couple Stanley cups that they did. Um, and also being there for 15 years, goalies usually don't last that long in the league. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of funny. He's going out with the worst stats than when he came in his rookie season. Um, 07, 08, he played four games. 1-2, lost one, one in overtime. 8-8-6 eight, eight, save percentage and 3.25 goals against. He goes out with four games played this season. 2-2 two and two record. Um. A 0.84 save percentage and a 4.28 goals <laughs> against. So the games that he did play, he got lit up this season, hence the beach ball reference. Um, but hell of a career. Hope you enjoy your retirement. Um, stay in retirement now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That concludes the end of today's NHL episode. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for all hockey news.